All right. So, quick little announcements. We're going to same format tonight. Um, I, I wanted. I, I've talked to some of the staff today. The the incident we had last night that involved one of our counselors in the who was struck and struck struck ill. I guess the best way to put it. And all the turmoil and everything that went on out there. I just want to thank y'all for for uh, not making it more difficult. You you you, you kept the space. You kept your place. You moved, I was very impressed because a lot of people would be wandering around, sticking their head in there, trying to figure out what's going on. You guys gave uh, the, the the EMS technicians uh, all the room and space they needed and everything. So I appreciate that. Y'all did a very good job on that. Uh, we're going to do exactly what we what we did. See here, I was told we're ready to go. And all right. Guys, everybody make sure that you look at the front of your, your handout, make sure it says part two. Uh, there's a real good chance I can get things mixed up and, uh, and, and it has happened. So make sure you got part two. All right, so same format tonight. We're going to go to about seven around that time. We'll take a break again. I want to thank y'all last night for the, um, uh, for the uh, respect of the time and respected me. And, and I, I, it's always, uh, but something that I notice that when I'm up here running my mouth and doing what I think it is what I think is what I want to do, uh, that you guys put up with me and are very respectful for it. And I appreciate that. I really do. Um, and again, so if you got any questions or anything, uh, please, please ask me. All right. Uh, before I get started, do, are there any questions about what we did last night? Okay. Is it? Do you understand the format, where I'm going, the theme, what I'm trying to do? I'm trying to make, make it simple, get you to understand how you can apply these steps and how they help. Is that, is that working? Okay, thank you. All right, so let me ask you some more questions. Uh, there are a lot of ponderables out there in the world. A lot of, a lot of, some of these questions seem to be unanswerable. There's always somebody that thinks they have the answer. <clears throat> But these ponderables, uh, I'm going to throw out there to you, and I just want to know uh, what you think about them and what's your take on them. Uh, for instance, why doesn't Tarzan have a beard? No, no. Well, nobody else does it. How did he shave? How did he shave? We don't know. Why do my feet smell and my nose run? Y'all stop me when you when you when you get enlightening. Enlightening. Why do they sterilize needles for lethal injections? Why do kamikaze pilots wear helmets? <laughs> On the way down. <laughs> Why is abbreviation such a long word? <laughs> Why do shrimp cost more the closer you get to the ocean? <laughs> Why does my trash weigh more than my groceries? That's a good one. Why do I park in a driveway and drive in a parkway? <laughs> Why do they call them stands when I sit in them? <laughs> Why do I sing take me out to the ball game when I'm already there? <laughs> Can vegetarians eat animal crackers? <laughs> this is deep. This is deep. If you try to fail and you succeed, what have you done? Can't do them both. You either fail. Why do you, you guys in the lounges, y'all still in, walked out yet? You still there? <laughs> Why do tugboats push barges? If a fly has no wings, is it a walk? <laughs> That's cruel, isn't it? Why, why are boxing rings square? <laughs> If a cow laughs, does milk shoot out of her nose? <laughs> Another deep one. What happens if you get scared half to death twice? <laughs> How come you never see a billboard being put up? Never seen one. Why are highways built so close to the ground? 
<laughs> and then to close, why is bra singular and panties plural? <laughs> That's damn good. I just hope you don't answer all these questions. <laughs> well, we don't answer these questions. We'll still go. Is there an old ham with hamburger? I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't want to know what's in hamburger sometimes. All right. I told you I was going to challenge you last night. Um, uh, I'm going to read you something that I wrote and. Um, it is somewhat of a, of a challenge. But what it's also is I'm asking you to think about something. We're, we're all about building here. We're all about taking down what doesn't need to be there and building back up. We're going to have that analogy later on in tonight's group, uh, in the night session. But sit back for a minute. Let me read you something I wrote one time for, for one of my patients. And uh, people have liked it, and so I'm going to share it with you. And if you want copies, I'll try to get you some. It's not like there's a copyright on it. And I didn't steal this. This is something I did right here. So, something to think about, and I don't want to throw this out there to you. I, it's called Your Personal Legacy. I grew up in a very small town. There weren't that many of us, but we were a close-knit bunch. We all went to the same school. Almost all of our parents worked for one of the three textile mills. There weren't but three churches, so the chances were good that you went to church together. Most of the friends I started first grade with, I also graduated high school with. There was a broken down basketball goal on a cracked concrete surface and beside it was a raggedy tennis court with tattered nets and we all used them. Siblings spread apart by many years had the same school teachers. Fathers and sons had the same coaches. It was not unusual for some to have taught and coached across at least three generations. Everyone knew everybody, even their own pets, even their pets. I probably didn't know your street address, but I knew exactly where you lived and I could get there on my bicycle. Our mothers bought, bought groceries at the Piggly Wiggly and we all went to the one doctor in town. So in a very real way, I suppose I came in contact with more people by the time I became an adult than other teenagers did that came from cities and towns much larger than mine. It may be a stretch, but there's a chance that at one point I either knew, met, or at least had seen everyone who lived in that town. Now, I might be wrong, but I don't think I'm far off. You couldn't possibly grow up in a town in a time like that and not be in contact with and influenced by the adults in the town. They were your school teachers, your coaches, your grocers, your neighbors, your postmen, your preachers, the garbage men. They were friends and co-workers of your parents, and you saw them every day everywhere you went. You knew them and they knew you. Thinking back, I may not remember their names, where they lived or what they did, but what sticks, what stays in my mind always is that I always remember how those people made me feel. In my memories from so many years past, I can still see their faces. I can't possibly recall everything we talked about or all of the stories that they shared. I'm sure by now the adults I knew growing up, well, they're probably all gone. But in my reminiscence, there's always the lingering sense, no matter what, of how those people made me feel. It could be a warm and friendly feeling. I might think of some as a source of, of strength, wisdom, and perhaps even generosity. But then again, some of my memories of them are frightening, and to this day still make, still make me feel intimidated or threatened somehow. Some feelings make me wish that I could spend just another hour with them. And some make me relieved I won't ever have to see them again. Some of those people from so long ago made me feel very inspired, motivated, energized to even be a better person. Some of those people just frankly left a bad taste in my mouth and still do. Some memories make me laugh, some make me very sad. But every one of them has left a feeling that has stamped an indelible and permanent impression about them, how I feel about them in some way. And that's their legacy. Those people in my small hometown and so many others I've met along the way, most long gone now, have left their imprints on my heart and soul. I learned from most of them, and what I learned sometimes made my path to adulthood easier. Some of them got me in trouble and taught me tricks I really didn't need to know as a, as a young adult. I once read that in forestry, the young trees are planted among the older ones. That way their new roots grow, follow and take hold in the paths of the older trees' roots. The older roots have been there before. They have broken up the soil. They show the way, they ease the way. 
The older trees help the younger ones grow. So let me ask you now, is this you? What pathway are you leaving behind? What do the imprints you have marked on the souls of others say about you? What way are you guiding? What feelings are you leaving behind? Are you making it easier or tougher for those coming after you? Now notice how I word this. I didn't ask if you were going to leave anything behind. I asked how what you do leave behind will affect others because you need to grasp and know this undeniable, inescapable, and universal truth. You will leave a legacy, and you can't avoid that. Trust me, there's no way out of it. You will leave a legacy of some sort to some people. What you need to start thinking about now is what will that legacy say about you, and how will it affect others? Think of it this way, and imagine your grave marker. It will have your name on it with the day you were born and the day you died. You have no control of what those two dates will be. But separating those two dates is a dash. Your life from the first day to the last day is in that dash. What does that dash say about you? Do you ever think about that? Did you think that I gave or did I take? Did I want more for someone else than I wanted it for me? Did I rise or fall when called on to be a bigger, better, stronger person? Did I meet or fail my obligations as a husband, a wife, father, or mother? Did I serve higher causes or only did I serve myself? Is anybody anywhere's life better because I was in it? Have I left the world a better place than how I found it? These are tough but necessary questions and you better start thinking about them for you need to know that that is how you and the life you live will be defined. What you did and for what you did to and for others and the feelings you left behind. I had an older gentleman one time as a client, a very polite, respectful, and refined gentleman in every sense of the word, word when sober, but testy and mean-spirited when drunk. And unfortunately, that was most of the time. He had a four-year-old grandson whom he adored. But one day, this man's daughter, the son's mother, told him that she was no longer going to allow him to visit the grandson, or would she allow her child to visit him until he got sober. One night in group, he told us that story, and he said that that statement from his, <laughs> his daughter shot through him with a chilling fear. He said, I had a drunk grandfather, and he was mean as hell. That man has been dead for over 50 years, and I'm still scared of him. That simply is not going to be how my grandson is going to remember me. As I write that, this gentleman is approaching over four years of sobriety, and he still contacts me with news and us with family. It means something very real and precious to be a healthy, loving grandfather, and I'm sure it means a lot to his family, too. And that's his legacy. The person may die, but the legacy never does. It has legs and a life of its own. It will walk freely through the corridors of the minds and the hearts of those you touch for all of their lives and will be passed on even more for other generations simply from the stories they tell about you. Legacies from others long dead are living and running in the conscious and unconscious stream of memories of people everywhere all the time. I'm sure you can think of some. Try to think of your funeral and how it will be. If you could visit your own funeral as some kind of angel or spirit, what would you like to hear your family and friends say about you? There are but two kinds of front, there are but two kinds of funerals. Celebrations or life, or is that son of a bitch finally dead? And I've been to both of them. I can tell you about those services where the grief and sadness was powerful, but not as forceful as the honor and pride that the friends and family felt in the time of their loss. As I said in the church, and I heard the spoken words about some of these deceased loved ones, it was almost like someone was singing a hymn. I would have the sense that I was floating in a warm, safe, so safe ocean of respect, love, and gratitude. I also can recall those services that were rushed, very little said, nothing much good to say. I went to a funeral once for someone whose own children did not attend. I knew both of his children. They were friends of mine, and I knew why they weren't there. And it made me feel grungy, like I was wearing an old filthy sweater that I couldn't wait to take off and throw away. 
Think about Ebenezer Scrooge and how after he viewed his death and heard what they said about him, he turned things around. What a gift of mercy that he was given a chance to make amends, redirect his life, create a new legacy. And tonight, that is you. That's everybody in this room. Among all the magnificent gifts and treasures that recovery offers the alcoholic and addict know this, perhaps the most lasting and powerful of all the benefits of recovery is a chance to redefine or if need be, recreate yourself. Think of words like redemption, repentance, amends, a recovery of your true best self. To leave a legacy of love and generosity, not one that is distasteful and disgusting, you should know this short but brutal definition of hell. Hell is when you die and who you are sees who you could have been. I've lived long enough to understand the brilliant and I open in wisdom in the next statement I'm getting ready to make. 10, 20, 30 years from now, you will look back at your life and you will look back. And when you do, you will see that you regret far more what you did not do than anything anybody did to you. You just don't want that regret. You really don't. Through recovery, that regret can be avoided. I entered treatment in October of 1992. Since that time, I have been given the chance to establish myself as a better man, citizen, husband, father, and now a grandfather. I have been offered a chance through grace to forge a new legacy. What if I had died in September of 1992? I don't even want to think about that. I don't even want to think of what my legacy is. It chills me to think what my legacy would have been then. I know full well what the words of the song Amazing Grace mean, and I live daily with the deep sense of gratitude that that song provides me. So here's what I'm asking you to do. As you set goals for yourself in quality recovery, among those goals, please place the word legacy. As you plan a vision of yourself and what you need to change to make that image a reality, ask yourself, if the person I love the most were to see or hear what I'm about to do or say, would I be okay with that? Let that thought guide your way. We are told that we should seek to plant trees under whose shade we know we will never sit. And do not fool yourself. There are people in your life that will one day plant, sit under the shade of the trees you plant through your words and actions. But what kind of tree are you planting? And what kind of shade will it provide? I really want you to understand what this thing called recovery will offer you. Not only your life back and your the re redemption of your own true best self, but guys, there are people you're going to affect that you haven't even met yet. There are people that you're going to affect you have, that aren't even born yet. And there are people in your immediate lives that you're going to affect. And you will leave a legacy. And I want you to think about that. What a gift, what a grace that we have been given the chance, a blessing, to redeem and, and reestablish another legacy. One far, far better than the one that perhaps we, leave, we have that's out there right now. So I want you to think about that. I really do. And understand that you, you cannot, you can't avoid that. Any questions or any comments? Any observations? Yes, ma'am. I needed to hear that in my daughter's name, Grace. I had a very bad conversation with her today. Thank you. Keep talking. Um, she basically, uh, I said that I wasn't there for since 18 and I wasn't there for her whole life. I was absent. She says, that's okay, I've gotten over that. And then uh, at the end, I told her I loved her, and she didn't say it back. All right, well, let me, Matt, thank you for sharing that. And what, a, what an opportunity you've been given. But let me, I just want to say something about that word love. Uh, there's some words out there that people don't really understand what they are. Love is one of them. Faith, love, and recovery. They're all action verbs. You do those things. You can tell your daughter, I'm sure you've told your daughter you love her a thousand plus a thousand times, but have your actions shown that? And here's what you have an opportunity now. Through your actions, through your behaviors, through the changed man, you, she's not going to wonder, and, and, and she's not even going to need the words. She will know that you love her through your actions. 
Guys, don't ever forget that. Recovery, faith, and love are all action verbs. If you can't show them, you don't have them. It's that simple. Thank you, Matt. Any other, anybody else? All right, let's move. I don't know how that works, but that's what it does. All right, definitions. What does being in recovery mean? Making changes. Making changes. Everybody can speak up now. Making changes. What is real, and what are we talking about? Changes just old people, places, and things? Behavior. Behavior changes. Think changes up here. Think changes here. Things that Matt is talking about. Things that are, he's going to change in his everyday actions that are going to show love to his children or child. Okay. What is relapse? What is relapse? Return to old behaviors. A return to old behaviors. Remember I talked about last night. All mental disorders have signs and symptoms that say that we're in a specific mental disorder. And those signs and symptoms are behaviors. And I'm not going to tell the corny joke again. But you can't x-ray for schizophrenia. You can't take tissue sample for OCD, any of those things. It's, it's all in the behavior. Well, alcoholism and addiction is a mental disorder. So we have to check our behaviors. Do my behaviors show a change? Are they healthier? Are they healthier? Are they productive? Are they honorable, are my behaviors? If they're not, you might be slipping back into, into, into what we call the relapse. People can be in relapse for months. People can be in relapse for a year. They slip back into the old behavior. We're not going to get there tonight, but tomorrow when we look at step 10, that's why step 10 is so brilliant. If you do the step 10 every night, honestly, sincerely, honestly, because that's step one, and you, you'll see what happened. Boy, I've slipped back into some old behaviors. I promised somebody I was going to do something, and I didn't do it. That's, that's not good. That's an old behavior. I need to, I need to do it. That, that kind of thing. <coughs> We're working off a definition of spirituality. Do you remember what the definition of spirituality is? Spirituality is measured by how you treat other people. How you treat other people. That is a very good gauge of the depth and the measure and the level of your spirituality. What is a principle? We're told to practice these principles in all our steps, in all our affairs. What are these? What is a principle? Honesty. Well, that's one of them. But what, what does the word mean? A set of morals and values. A fundamental truth, right, you, you, you can, it could be defined that way. A fundamental truth that guides behavior, a fundamental truth, like honesty, that guides behavior, and when practiced, honors the person practicing them. What is the spiritual awakening that we talked that you'll find out more about tomorrow in, in step 12? It's on page 569 or 567. What is the goal of this thing? Guys, you got to know this stuff. Is this a higher power? Fun, spiritual awakening is a change of character. Change of character. And we're going to talk about tonight in step four and five how to identify those changes of character. What are the principles in step one and two? That's step one. What about two? Oh, really? Hope. Step two is hope. As powerful as any word there is, hope. What are the two things mentioned in the 12 steps? First of all, I do a good job. I, do, I just, I'm so proud of me. First of all. <laughs> the progression of the principles, what you got in step one, you need to complete so you can do step two. What you got in step one and two, you can do step three. That's why they have to be done in that order. That's why they had to be done in that order. I, it took me almost, almost not quite, but very close, two years to do the third step. It almost took me two years to do the third step because the third step had the G word in it. And I didn't want anything to do with that. And I thought I was, as y'all know, I'm a very smart person. And I thought I had a very good argument with my count, uh, sponsor. And I would say, Dennis, uh, oh, Irish Dennis, I'd say, um, I've got, I think the 11 step program is beautiful. I, I, I think I can do 11 of them. I'm just not going to do the third one. And he would look at me and he'd say, what comes after two, Warren? And I'd say three. He said, what comes before four, Warren? And I'd say three. He said, after number two, you will do three, and we won't go anywhere. We won't get to four, you get there. Thank God, thank God, that man held my feet to the fire. Uh, what is H.O.W.? Oh, another theme is introspection. 
look within, look within, look within. Look within, look within, look within. What is H-O-W? Oh, that's an easy one. So y'all, did, you didn't get zero on the test. And what are the two tasks required to work the steps? Identify the character defects that need to be changed and be willing to do to change them. Identify and willing. Okay. Now that we did, we've got such a great grasp of both the fundamentals here. Let's move on. Let's go to step three. Having done step one and two, having established that we, in my life, it's part of me, I'm going to be rigorously honest, and I'm accepting of things that I need to be accepting of, and I've kept hope alive that, that this program and other people can, that there is an answer, I'm going to have to find the, the people or, or the higher powers I'm going to put my faith and trust in. So what is step three? Faith and or trust. That's the principle. Let's talk about self-will because step, uh, uh, step three is all about will and self-will. The first requirement for taking step three is we be convinced that any, li any life run on self-will can hardly be a success. It, and, and, and I don't know about y'all, but I got a pretty good idea. But when my hands were on the wheel, there was a wreck. People got hurt and things got broken. So I knew that my way, what even my dumb ass was smart enough to figure out my way wasn't working and there had to be another way and maybe I need to talk to other people about that other way. Our whole trouble had been the misuse of willpower. Let's look at that word willpower. Let's make sure we understand that. There are great philosophical debates about one, does man actually have willpower and two, if so, why? Now, I ain't getting into all that tonight. But, but I, I do think that there is willpower. I'm not real sure why we have it, because we always screw it up. But let's understand what willpower means. First of all, I say that willpower is very, very dangerous to the early recovering alcoholic and addict. And why do I say that? And I mean that with all my heart. Why do I say willpower is dangerous? Because your will is already breaking down the wrong road. With mostly, you know, remember all about, we got the cheerleader, Sue, it's all about me. What's the first word in any willpower state? I. I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. How has that worked so far? So I, the willpower right now pulls you away from the fellowship, pulls you away from step two, which means you have to surround yourself with higher powers and believe in them in step three. So that's not very good. And also, uh, you just, again, we're just working off a wounded brain that's just really geared right now still to think about using a, a drinking and drugging. Let's look at some willpower. I, we drank for happiness and became unhappy. We drank for joy and became miserable. We drank to be outgoing and became self-centered. We drank for sociability and became argumentative. We drank for sophistication and became crude and obnoxious or what somebody would say, rude, crude, and socially unattractive. We drank for friendship and we made enemies. We drank for sleep and we awakened without rest. We drank for strength and we felt weak. We drank for, we drank for relaxation and we got the shakes. We drank for confidence and we became doubtful. We drank for freedom and we became slaves. And again, this is just a, one of the constant themes of mine that you will hear from me over and over again. Alcoholism and addiction is slavery. Recovery is freedom. That's what you are fighting for, your personal freedom. We drank for power and we became powerless. We drank for our health and we got sicker. We drank to make conversation and we slurred our words. We drank to feel heavenly we knew hell. We drank to forget and we were haunted. We drank to erase problems and we saw them multiply. We drank to cope with life and we invaded death. So that's why we're using our willpower to usually take us. So what is the best use and definition of free will? Let's look, let's look at what that thing called free will really is. And this is really broken down. Again, I, I said it's very deep philosophical discussion. So, but I've broken it down in a way that I think I, I understand it and I'd like to pass that on to you. First, you must be aware and understand that every action you take will affect you and someone else in some way. Think legacy on that. That's called the ripple effect. If you were to be suspended on that, that pond or lake out of there, whatever they call it, and you drop a penny in the middle of it, at some point, eventually, every ripple 
that that penny makes will touch every square inch of, out of the shoreline. Now, it might take a while and you might not see it, but it will. It eventually will reach there. What you do touches everything. Knowing that, before you take any action at all, you stop and ask yourself, what will be the consequences of what am I about to say or do? You get a more useful answer by asking, how will this action make others feel and what will it say about me? See, you're already entering into the realm of spirituality there. How would this action affect others? Remember what's the definition? The definition of spirituality is how you treat others. You're already moving into a more spiritual realm there by saying, gee, if I say this thing or I do this thing, how will it affect other people? And what will it say about me? In other words, you're free to make decisions, but you're, but you're not free to establish the consequences of your decisions. Sometimes the consequences are out of your hands. So you, it's your choice, you must choose wisely. And here's how you choose. What will it, how will this affect others, and what will it say about me? If you can honestly determine that this action will not hurt others, and will at the same time honor you, then that's the proper use of free will. That's the proper use of free will. Will it, will it not harm others, and what does it say about you? So that's, that's more of a working definition of free will, this will thing that we're handing over to higher powers. Also in step three, there's a huge look at the reduction of self-will. Now I will tell you that every major religion and every major philosophy addresses the reduction of free will. If you read anything from C.S. Lewis, he talks about that extensively. If you read anything from Mark Twain, a lot of his themes are about the reduction of self-will. If you know anything about the tragedies of the plays of the Shakespeare, we got any Shakespeareans in here? Often they talk about in the tragedies, the tragedy that is a result of what? Free will. Think King Lear, Othello, uh, Macbeth. Think those things. Um, I'll, I'll, and he speaks about the, 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 that's why the plays are called tragedies. When our self-will becomes more important than what's going on around us. Let me give you guys a relationship law. Let me give you a relationship law, kind of on the line of self-will. You can write it down if you want to, but, but it, there are several laws of relationship. Here's one of them. If the ego, if you establish that your ego is more important than the relationship, you will harm the relationship. In other words, if the I becomes more important than the we, the we will die. That's the major killer of most relationships. What I want in my relationship with whomever, what I want is more important than the benefit and the health of the relationship, and it will kill the relationship. And that's, that's self-will. That's that all about me. That's why it's so important to reduce the ego, reduce the self-will. Uh, let's see. This is a key theme in the readings that influence Bill Dutton. Self-serving William James, who was a huge, huge influence. He wrote this book called The Varieties of the Religious Experience. Self-serving is fatal to the growth of spirituality. The growth of what? Being able to treat other people in a dignified way. <laughs> Remember the definition. He goes on to say that only in the service of others can one realize true worth. This book, the, the Varieties of Religious Experience, according to Bill Wilson, was a huge influence of his. It's a series of lectures. William James was the first American to ever be invited over to Oxford in like 1901 and do lectures over there. And uh, they collected the lectures and they made this book called The Varieties of Religious Experience. It's a fascinating book to read. And if anybody has a problem going to sleep, I recommend that you buy this book. <laughs> Because it will, it, it's dry, but it's got a lot of good stuff in there. It will, in about three or four pages, you will fall asleep. I, I remember, I, I was always challenging myself. I want to read that book, I want to read that book. And one time I was flying to San Francisco, and I, I think it was like a four-hour flight out. I really can't remember. And uh, we probably had to crop dust some fields in Kansas on the way over there and everything. But, uh, but um, I said, okay, well, I'm going to put that book in my bag and I'm going to read it over there. And I slept just about the whole way to San Francisco. Uh, I, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult read, but a fascinating read when you can. Also, um, and think about it. In, the tri in our triangle, the AA triangle, what's one of the legs? Service. Service. <laughs> service to others. What does our 12 step say? Carry the message to others. All about others. The, the, the man who uh, established the Salvation Army, 
last name started with a W, I, mean, I can't remember. Anyway, uh, and there was an interview, he was being interviewed not long before he died, and somebody asked him, said, well, what is your philosophy about life? What is your, what, is, what guides you in life? He said, I can tell you my philosophy in life in one word, others, others, service to others. Uh, also, uh, the Sermon on the Mount was a huge influence of Bill, Bill Wilson's, he wrote the big book. I'll tell you a little, and, and he, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. That's, they shall inherit the earth. The reduction of the self-will. I'll give you a little uh, AA trivia. Uh, every one of the 12 steps comes from a Bible script. Every one of them. He just wrote it in secular language so he could sell a book. All right. So what step three is? Don't, don't get too hung up on step three. Step three is simply a call to honestly accept step one that the brain ain't working so good, and maybe larger forces, higher powers out there can help me. Now that's identify, I've identified this. It is simply a decision to correct our character defects, how? Under spiritual supervision, under other people who are more spiritual in nature than we are, or higher powers. And that's just how principled spiritual growth is established there. I think I'll ask them. I think I'll ask them. I, I've identified that I need help from higher powers. I think I'll ask them, and that'll be willing. I used to go to an all men's meeting in, down at Delray Beach on Saturday morning. My sponsor and I would go, and um, I got off on one of my whatever I would get off on back then, and, and because I always made so much sense, I was always a damn smart. Mm -hmm. And um, and about halfway through my dialogue or, or my pity party, whatever I was in. Uh, this guy turned around, his old man turned around and looked at me, he said, boy, you're in your own damn way. And I, it took me back, and I thought about that for a long time, and, I, and he was exactly right. I was in my own way. Get out of the way. Get out of the way. Reduce your, reduce your ego. Reduce your ego. Now, the God, as we understand him, now I'm not going to go into my two-year battle with this thing. It would take too long. If we had time, I might tell you a little bit more about it. But... But um, this is the part, this is where I really got hung up on. So we have to become more willing, there's that word again, to depend on higher powers. The more, in, the more we become willing to depend on a higher power, the more independent we actually are. That is a great statement. That is a great statement. Just, just, it just makes so much sense. Why don't, why don't you, then Bill Wilson said, well, why don't you choose your own conception of God? And then he went on to say, it is only a question of my being willing, there's that word again, to believe in a power greater than myself or help. Remember the definition of a higher power. Anybody, anything that could help me do what I could not do by myself. Nothing more was required of me to make, a belief, to make my beginning. Just believe that there's help out there. Hope that there's help and then have faith and trust that they are. I have to honestly admit, there's step one, that I had a problem and accept that and admit that I needed help. That's all. That's all. H-O-W. Again, as we understand it, lack of power, there's that powerlessness thing again, that's our dilemma. We had to find a power by which we could live, and it had to be a power greater than ourselves. That's just a no-brainer. That's, that's, just, that's just common sense. But where and how to find this higher power? He goes on to say, and he's, what is he talking about here? A lot about when, about step four. When we became alcoholics, now, now read carefully here, crushed by what? A self-imposed crisis. A self-imposed crisis. By our own responses to what life and what life had handled us, we had to fearlessly face the proposition that God is or God ain't. And again, that's C.S. Lewis, William James, and a bunch of other people. What was our choice to be? Now that's all I'm going to throw out there to you. I'm not going to. I'm not going to turn missionary here on you. Uh, you, it's your call. But what Bill Wilson puts that right in our face. What is it? God is or God ain't. What you going to do? Which one is it? There was a very popular man back at the time in New York, and uh, when Bill was was working, was in the Oxford group, and Eddie was in the Oxford group, and uh, they were all trying to figure out how, Roland Thatcher and all those guys were in the Oxford group, and they were trying to figure out how to do, get this thing and how to maybe perhaps move into another area of their own belief system. 
and they, there was a guy named Sam Shoemaker. He was a very famous Episcopal priest. He had a radio show there in New York, and he loved to work with alcoholics. He loved to work with the drunks. He would, he would go get them out of hospitals and jails and skid row, and he would talk to them. He naturally, Bill Wilson fell in his lap. Bill Wilson would talk to him. Bill Wilson was an agnostic, uh, a very deep agnostic. And, and again, not to go too deep in the weeds about what all that means, but he was one of those guys that said, okay, if there's a God, there's a God, I don't care. If you want God, you can have God. I don't. I'm not interested. He wasn't one of those guys that said there ain't one. He just he said, okay, if there's one, that's fine. I'm just not interested. And so, but he worked a lot with Sam Shoemaker, this this Episcopal priest. So it was Sam uh, Bill Wilson was never known to have owned a Bible, and, but he did a lot of work out of it. It was from Sam Shoemaker that we absorbed most of the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Some people, some historians out there, say Sam Shoemaker wrote the twelve steps. I don't think so. There's just too much uh, uh, letters and too many things that show that Bill Wilson did that a lot on his own, and there's old manuscripts that show that. But he damn sure got influenced by Sam Shoemaker. And here's what the advice he gave to, sent to Bill Wilson, who Bill Wilson passed it on about this third step and the God concept. And he just basically said this, Bill, God is personal. Go find yours. That's all he said to him. And then he had another bit of advice that he said, okay, give as much of yourself that you can to as much of a God that you understand and work from there. And so what is the third step? The third step, let's look, it's just basically kind of like a doctor-patient relationship. I spoke yesterday, last night, many times about using the metaphor of, of, the, of this medicine and doctor-patient relationship. And it works like this. The doctor is your higher power. He or she can do what? Do for you what you cannot do for yourself. That's the original definition of a higher power. So I must have faith or trust that the doctor, in this case my higher power, <clears throat> excuse me, always wants what is best for me, knows what is best for me, and will develop a plan of treatment that will help me be healthy and whole. Right there, 12 steps. My responsibility in this relationship is to follow all the doctor's orders thoroughly, willingly, and with gratitude, even enthusiasm. If I do, I get healthier. And what happens when I get healthier? The promises. I get the promises. If I don't, then I've not shown any honesty and acceptance. I haven't done step one. I haven't shown any hope. I haven't done step two. And I have no faith and trust in the doctor or his or her plan. So I've not done step three. And I stay miserable. I stay miserable. So again, this is forming relationships with others. This is more power through numbers. This is just asking, knowing that you need help and asking, and trusting the help that you get. And, the, and your, your care will be provided. By putting your life and will in the care of higher powers and larger forces, I don't, i tell you what, I, again, I, I don't, I don't and I will not make major decisions in my life by myself. I don't do it. I talk to people I trust. I obviously talk to my wife. I talk to people who are maybe involved in that decision, who are offering some decision for me, but I do not, and I will not, because I've done it, and it, and I blew, it blew up in my face every time. Make a decision by myself. I always talk to somebody. Now, eventually, of course, I'm going to have to finally make that decision, but I'm going to get input. I'm going to get feedback from others, and that's all of this. That's all this is. By putting your life and will in the care of higher powers or larger forces, one, you're reducing your ego, like I know everything, Removing self-will and admitting that on my own, I cannot do this, honesty and acceptance, and with the help of others, it can happen. Hope. And then I'm going to trust what they tell me. Now, listen, uh, this quote right here is, is one of the most widely read quotes in, in the whole big book. Our trouble, they arise out of ourselves, not about others, out of ourselves. And the alcoholic is an extreme will example of what? Self will run riot. Or an alcoholic or addict by himself is outnumbered. Yes, sir. What does that mean, self will run riot? Well, it means that when you're running the show by when I'm running the show by myself, calling all the shots, using no my self will and nothing else from anybody else, there's probably gonna be a riot breakout. 
Something's going to get broken. Something's going to get hurt. And it's probably me. Now, I've learned that in the hard way. And I don't do that anymore. I mean, I'm not saying that I make perfect decisions, but uh, I, I, I don't make them by myself. I, I just I just try to leave my will out. Are you familiar at all with the third step prayer? You should be if you're not. It's in the big book. The second line of the third step prayer is relieve me of the bondage of self. We're basically relieve me of me so I can better do your way. Take me out of the bridge. Sometimes, James, Jason, sometimes when I uh, when I do the third step prayer, that's the only line I'll say. Just get me out of it because I'll blow, I'll screw it up even worse. Get me out of the way. I know me. I've been around me a long time. I know. You want something broke, you let me touch it. All right. What page are we on here? Decision. So we make a decision. Let's understand the words. Decision from Latin, to decide. It means to cut away. To decide is to cut away all indecision. All indecision. All doubt. All distractions. All our alternatives. And commit to a set course of action. Let's look at that word commit. I will say. Would, but I don't know, but I don't think I'm going to be wrong. That the men and women sitting in this room, or the men and women that can hear me, and when you had a relapse, you at one time there's somewhere you come, you picked up a white chip, you went to another place. I don't know, but somewhere somehow you made a commitment. I will be clean and sober. I will be free. You made that commitment. I will venture to say that your relapse was all about that you left the commitment of that. You dropped your commitment. You gave up. You quit. You stopped. You can't do that. You can't do that. You can't do that. It, 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 it just doesn't work that way. You you know why people don't reach their goal? People set goals all the time. You know why you don't reach your goal? I want to lose weight. I want to quit smoking. I want to be clean. Yeah, I, I want to get uh, I want to get a degree in something. Who was it? What did you say? Yeah, acid. A bit, you know, at first, you're wide open. You're on fire. Yeah, I'm going to do this and everything. And then what starts happening? Did you lose your commitment to the goal? No. What you stopped doing was the everyday day and things it took to make that commitment stay alive. And when we stop, when we, matter of fact, um, Chris, that's one of the, sometimes when I'm able to talk to some people that are leaving treatment, that's one of the things I look at and say, don't half ass this thing. Don't do that. Don't go out there and half ass it because it will catch up with you. Guys, you just, if you don't take your meds, if you don't practice your principles, which are your meds, when you stop taking your meds, your disease is going to come back, and that is science. That's the law. That's medicine. I worked at the Institute of Psychiatry for three years, and um, on the real acute unit, the real one flew over the cuckoo's nest crowd, and um, and and they were they we always had several pretty hardcore schizophrenics in there. And that was back in the lithium in the uh, Depakote days, uh, Haldol and Respiral were kind of first coming out. And, um, and they could give these people their medicines and work with them a little bit. And the, and the social worker would come down and work on their, what call activities of daily living, basically tell them how to brush their teeth, wash their hands again. And, and you get these people kind of okay. Kind of okay, and the parent and the family would come get them, and off they'd go. And I would, um, I'd come back to work about three weeks later, and that'd be old Harry sitting there. And I'd look at him, and he'd look at me, and I said, Harry, you quit taking your meds, did He said, Yes. Yeah. Yep. Bam. Came right back every time. That's us. That's us. Schizophrenia is a mental disorder. Alcoholism and addiction is a mental disorder. When we stop taking our meds, guys, we're going to get sick again. And when we start half assing it, but here's what I say about that, Chris. And I said this the other day, or last night. It is in the practicing of these principles that we become principle. See, there's a payoff bigger than just getting sober. There's a payoff, a huge payoff. We become the better people. We become. And I'm going to talk to you at least about that here tonight, or tomorrow night, or before we get through. And that's a beautiful thing. I, that's why people say, I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic. All right, so 99% equals 0%. Our will is a manner of thinking. It's what guides us, it motivates us, directs us. It's what we use to make things happen. But did we do that wisely? 
I didn't. So what do we do? We're going to turn our will. Hey, what do you guys think about this? How do y'all feel about this? I got this thing I want to do, or I got my, I might make this move. I might take this other job. What do you think about that? God, isn't it a blessing to know that you can go, some, go to people and, and get a very good, genuine response back, input back? It would be very smart because it's a no-brainer for us to give this thing over to those wiser, more experienced, and know better than what's best. And those are higher powers. And that's step three. Took me a long time to realize that. So I spent uh, two hours last night and almost an hour a night to say this. Short version of the first three steps. I can't, they can, I'll let them. Y'all can say it. Damn you, good orange. You damn boy. Yeah. You can say it. Yeah, yeah but I wish I'd admitted that. <laughs> Real quickly, Mark, don't you say a word. If you're going to build a foundation to a home, if you're going to build a foundation to a home, I don't care if this home is a is a, a two thousand dollar shed or a, or a two hundred million dollar mansion somewhere. When you're going to build a home, what is the first thing you got to do? Plan. Well, you plan, okay, there's your plan right there. And then you gotta clear it, and that's detox. And then what do you gotta do? You gotta put a foundation down there, a cold gray slab. You're gonna put that foundation there exactly like it's supposed to be laid. You're not gonna take a shortcut on the cement. You're not gonna take a shortcut on the sand. You're not gonna take a shortcut at dimensions. You're damn sure not gonna walk around with a sledgehammer or a pickaxe and start tearing the, the, the foundation up. Because what are you gonna put on top of that foundation? The rest of your life. The mansion that you're building called you. But you can't do that until you put that foundation down there. And when you put that foundation down there, you do not ever mess with it. You don't chip away at it. You don't make shortcuts. You go straight at it. You stay honest. You be very accepting of other people, places, and things. You keep hope alive, and you have faith and trust in other powers, and you help them. I heard a guy tell a story one time in a meeting in Jacksonville. And why I was in a meeting in Jacksonville is a whole other story. But I, I think I spent a week in Jacksonville that night. But um, <laughs> <laughs> he said, and he told a story, and I immediately called BS on it until he helped me understand. He said he was at a grocery store somewhere and he paid for whatever. And when they got the change back, he had like, to get this, he said he had like a quarter. Too much change. They gave him a quarter more than he was supposed to get. So he says, walking out to the car, it's bothering him. He came in. He said, I put the groceries in the car and I went back and I stood in line and I gave the girl the quarterback. Now I'm sitting there and I'm going, no, ain't nobody does that. Nobody does that. Pardon? Oh, saying, who counts that? Who counts that? Who counts that? But here's the thing. Here's what he went on to say. And this is how it made sense to me. And that's why I remember the story so well. He said he knew he who him. He knew who he was. And if it's a quarter today, remember, chipping away at the foundation of honesty, it's going to be $5 the next day. And if it's $5 the next day, then it's going to be his roommate's wallet. And then when he gets to his, after his roommate's wallet, he's going to be lying about other things. He's, it's a snowball effect, guys. So don't doubt me. That's how it works. You start with a little lie here, a little something here, and bam, the next thing you know, you got a snowball so big at the bottom it wipes out the whole village. And it starts with that little, don't let it go. And he went on, he said, and he said, then I knew that I would eventually get to the biggest lie I could ever tell myself. And that lie is, I don't have a drinking problem. I never did. He said to start with a quarter. And I sat there and thought about that. And I said, no, he's right. He's right. How many times have I done something that I wouldn't, didn't want to do? But I started the process. Somewhere I started the process. That's why we can't do that, guys. You can't do that. You've got, they call it rigorous honesty in the big book. You've got to just be as honest as you possibly can at all times. Psychologically, psychologically, because I think I'm a little, I'm getting a little, I think I'm a little bit ahead. There's a concept called the side. This is just don't look for it in your handouts. This, but it's what I'm talking about as far as honesty. And don't mess with honesty. There's a concept called the silent killer, and it works like this: that we want to run around and say, "I have low self-esteem. I've done 
thousands of treatment plans in, in my career. And I put low, what, what's your, I got low self-esteem. Okay, tell me about low self-esteem. I put low self-esteem in so many of my treatment plans, I couldn't, and why, why do you have low self-esteem? Well, mama didn't do this. Well, daddy did do this. Well, my wife didn't do this. My dad, my husband, everything like that. They tore me down, made my self-esteem look low. Let me tell you a secret. Let me tell you something right now. That's a lie. Nobody, nobody has the power to reduce your self-esteem. It can't be done. This is how it happens. One is you start buying into the lie that those people are saying or how they treat it makes you feel. That's one way. Another way is that when we start violating honesty, when we start violating integrity, i.e. lies, stealing, cheating, manipulating, which we're all very good at. We've all done. Don't tell me you didn't. What that does is that starts a process in the very deep subconscious part of the brain, and it creates a tape or a disc for the newcomers. And that disc runs all the time. And you know what it says? You know what that tape says? I can't be trusted. My word means nothing. I am of no value. I, I'm a liar. I'm a thief. And it runs and it runs and it runs and it runs. You might not hear it, but your subconscious here. And it runs and it runs. And as it does, it absolutely shreds your self-esteem. You are the architect of that. That's why we do a lot of drinking and drugging. We have such a low, corroded this, the opinion of ourselves, we can't live like that. So what is, what is the, don't go up and complicate this, what, what's the remedy for that? Create a new tape, create a new tape. Do, what does our program tell us over and over again? To do what? Do the next what? Right, right thing. thing, right? How brilliant is that? How brilliant is that? That's, that's, boy, that's, that's, isn't that great? All I like to erase that tape or reverse that tape or to rise, raise my self esteem, all I got to do is start doing the right thing. When I was down in South Florida, I so told y'all I lived down there almost three years. They had a big community place down there and they had all, this is new age stuff down there. They had all kind of weird ass meetings and all kind of stuff, everything. And then there was this big bulletin board. It was, it was like half that wall over there. And you see all these meetings you could go to and all these, these new miracle workers all this stuff that you know moon rocks and diamonds and crystals and all that crap and everything and i'm looking up there and 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 they have meetings on self-esteem how to re raise your self-esteem classes on self-esteem boy i read that i said i got it. that's me i read one of the little tabs off uh, it's like tuesday seven o'clock i'll be there for tuesday seven o'clock i show up i got my notepad i got um i got my pencils i'm already how am i gonna raise my self-esteem because i had the lowest seven. i was so far i was so far down there now how am i gonna raise my self-esteem I, I can't wait now all the most of these classes that they gave were free but they did pass a basket so they called it the love offer so I had my little $10 bill ready in there. I better figure I could flip them a 10 for doing this class. I'm sitting there, I'm right at the front of the table, and this guy's talking and everything, and somebody raised their hand, and, and, and this first meet, first class, and the, and, and the guy said, yes, sir. And, he, and, and somebody said, well, how do you raise your, how do you raise your self-esteem? Boy, I was writing my wheelhouse. How do you, boy, I'm ready now. How do you raise your self-esteem? Right? I'm ready for about a two-hour lecture. How to raise self-esteem? The guy looked at him and said, you do esteemable things. I gave my $10 in the basket and never went back. You do esteemable things. Wow. Don't overcome. Don't overcome. It's actually pretty simple. All right. Maybe we should stop there because that we're, we're right on. Um, uh, I'm going to move into step four from here. Any questions before we break? I got a quick question. Please. What, uh, what low self esteem is kind of infused in you at a very young age? Uh, parents, loved ones, whatnot. That's a great question. And that happens. And this and this in this room a hell of a lot more than you might think it is. The child does the child really can't tell the difference. The child really does think that's who I am. I am what has happened to me. I am what's going around me. Daddy left mom. Well my friends' daddies didn't leave their mama, so there must be something wrong with me. That kind of thing. The divorce thing and all that stuff happens. That's where honesty comes in. Because at some point, that child, or that who now maybe perhaps is an adolescent or maybe an adult, is going to, you, you've heard me say this a hundred times, Keith, you've got to look within yourself and say, 
is that real? Is that right? This thing I've been thinking about myself because of the situation I was in. You know, I was born in poverty. I went to school. I, everybody had nice clothes. I, I'm, I'm wearing, you know, third and fourth and fifth, you know, thrift store clothes, and they're laughing at me. So I, there must be something wrong with me. That kind of thing. Those things happen all the time. As in, in it's at some point somewhere you've got to stop. Everybody has to do that. Everybody has to stop and say, "Who am I really?" Is that right? Am I what that situation said I am? And of course you're not. Of course you're not. Just vice versa. You're born filthy rich. And you think you are somebody. And you walk around talking about, you know, we always talk about people, you know, people who are born on third base and they think they hit a triple. You know, you, at some point you're going to have to stop. Really, I, you know, I've been given these great blessings, but who am I really? Who am I really? If you want a great example of that, um, if, 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 if I don't care if you're Catholic, believe it or not, the, the book, the book, the biography of St. Francis is absolutely fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. You know about a weird dude? But that's what he did. He examined his life. He didn't like what he found, and he gave away everything and, and, and created the, San Fran, the, the Franciscan order, which is all about service. All about service. I could get off on that. Read that. But you're, that's a great question. What if you if that's been hammered into you, you're less than you're no good you're fun all that kind of stuff at some point all of us all of us every human being alive should stop and say who am I really what defines me what do I believe in when people see me what do they see when I look in the mirror what do I see who do I see we all have to do that a, a life a, a, an unexamined life I think it was Plato and I might have it in here somewhere. An unexamined life, Plato said, an unexamined life is worth it. We all should do that. What a great question, and I hope uh, I hope a lot of people benefited from that question. Because what a great what a great opportunity you've been given in a place like this, in a, in a beautiful setting, to sit back and do that and, and really contemplate. Who am I really? What do I really believe? Who, what defines me? If this thing happens, what am I going? We, when we talk about integrity, uh, which is coming up in the fifth step, integrity is. I'm not going to get ahead of myself, but that's what integrity is. Integrity is about a moral code. You might, we might have to stop and ask ourselves, do I even have one? Do I even have a code that I live by? And a lot of us don't, Pete. A lot of us don't. And that's scary. You got that many people running around? Okay. Any other questions on that? I hope that, I, I'm glad you asked that. Any other questions? I uh, like 15, 16 after, or no, that's 15, 11 or 12. After. We ready to fly here? Come on, let's go. All right, uh, men's lounge and women's lounge, we're going to get going. Go to page 16. All right, four, great question there to end the thing. All right, step four. I don't know about y'all. I don't know how it's been. I don't know if times have changed or whatever. But I remember when I was in treatment, Step four was whispered. People whispered out step four. Ooh, way do you get step four? Step four is awful. Step four is the worst thing you'll ever go through. You'll cry and you'll die when you go through step four. It was this ominous thing about, oh, step four. Step four is so horrible and all that. And I wasn't so darn sure. And it, maybe it's a good thing why I didn't do the third step for about two years. Because I wasn't so sure I wanted to do this horrible exercise called step four. Let me tell you, and, and I don't know, that might be some of the atmosphere or, or, or some of the climate you guys talk about with step four. That ain't right. That ain't what it is. It ain't what it is. Step four is a cleansing exercise. Step four is a transformation. And when you couple it with step five, it really does, it is a game changer. So don't dread step four. Uh, well, people would say that. And the other thing I'll tell you, don't ask me about uh, if, your, if your counselor has given you a form for step four to do, do it, do it. You could Google step four and get 5,000 different uh, printouts on how to, how to do it. Do what, you, do what your counselor said. So step four, a moral inventory. And what is the, what is the uh, principle of step four? Courage, courage. That is the principle. Think about it, guys. Think about this beautiful transformation from powerlessness in step one to courage. We're already at courage. We've only done step four. We've only done step four. Courage brings us into courage. If we had to live, we had to be free from anger. 
Resentment is the number one offender. From it stems all form of a spiritual disease. We have been spiritually sick. Step four is an exercise in resolving some of these resentments. But let me go off on my little tangent here. And I said it the other day and I say it again. Resentments are unresolved anger. Resentments may be for a lot of you the reason you came through the front door. You have some unresolved anger about somebody or someplace or something, or perhaps even yourself, and that's intolerable to you. You can't stand the toxins it puts in you, so we drink and drug over that. If you're not working on those resentments while you are here, you're going to walk out of here with the same resentments you walked in with, and you're going to get hit right in the mouth sooner than later. My challenge, my plea as your brother in recovery, Get with your counselor, get with whoever you trust, and say, I have this very specific resentment toward this person, place, thing, or everything. It eats me alive. I need to get rid of it, or I need to at least put myself in a place where I control it rather than it controls me. And if you're not doing that, you, you, I don't know how you're going to pull this thing off because you're going out there with the same crap you walked in with. And right here it is right here. Resentment's number one offender. And as a professional at this, I'm telling you right now, my business, yes, yes it is. Yes it is. It will kill your recovery. Because it just, you can't hold up under that. Please be working on those. Put it out of our minds the wrongs other had done. Now here's step four. Look at step four. All right, this is how we do it. Put it out of our minds what others have done. We look for our own mistakes. We look for our own responses. How did I not handle that situation so well? Not because I'm a bad guy, not because I'm a dummy, I just didn't know better. I had this intolerable situation I was in, I had to have some relief, here came alcohol and drugs or whatever, they gave me relief, I got addicted to them, That's not, that does not make me a bad guy. In my way of thinking, it makes you a fighter. It makes you a fighter because you were fighting for your life. But we have to find them and we have to root them out. Bad fruits, bad roots. We got to root them out. And that's what step four does. It looks at our mistakes and how they have violated our code and turned us against what we really truly believe in. We reviewed our own conduct, not the inventories of others. You can't change them. What are you trying to do is seek only to change yourself. And how do you do that? What's the magic word? Introspection, introspection, introspection. Look within, look within, look within. I want you to hear me in your dreams. <laughs> look within, look within, look within. How could my responses have been better? How did my responses hurt me, bring down my self esteem? How could my responses be more honorable? What is a moral? Well, morals are the rightness of human. We're taking a fearless moral inventory. We're looking at the rightness of human behaviors. Has my behavior been morally sound? Probably not, because they weren't right. So step four is an intense, honest, thorough searching, and fearless look or introspection, 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 and not what has happened, but how our responses have shattered our morals or our rightness. Accountability is very powerful here, guys. You get very powerful when you become accountable for what you've done. And that's what step four and step five ask us to do. These inappropriate responses have become my character defects. Anger, whatever, uh, dishonesty, stealing, isolating, revenge, whatever, uh, coldness, hardness, whatever, resentment. Those are our character defects and have blocked and restricted the growth and presentation of our true best selves and created false personalities. So that's what we're going in there to look at. How have I done wrong? How have my behaviors violated me? How have my behaviors lowered my self-esteem? How have my behaviors been less honorable? Now, here's a key point, and write it, and I'm, I need to put it on the presentation. There is a very key point here to be made. Do not go into this fourth step when you are rooting yourself out, splitting this thing open and looking in there and finding who you are. Do not go in there and judge or condemn yourself. 
That's not the attitude. That is your disease working on you. That is counterproductive. You're going in there with now I have been given the opportunity. I have found a program. A program has been offered me that says, here's how I can become the person, the man, the woman I want to be and root the stuff out. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Wow, I've been looking for this all my life. Enthusiasm, enthusiasm. Nothing great was ever achieved without enthusiasm. And I'm telling you, changing yourself is a great thing. It's a great thing. So be enthusiastic about this. It'd be very easy. I did it. I did it. And I was wrong. And thank goodness I had people around me that helped me understand that's not how you do that. You, this is not an exercise to tear yourself down. It's an exercise to build yourself back up. So attitude is huge. Attitude is huge. Don't judge. Don't condemn. So let's look at this thing called morals. By courageously, there we are. Well, what did we learn in step four, courage? Step four is going to help us in step five. We identify thoroughly those defects and acknowledge, uh, acknowledging them and see how we have acted against our morals, our innate goodness, and how that has created so much shame. It puts us in a position to have those defects removed later in the 12 step program. And I say that most alcoholism and addiction is shame based. It is shame. There's a great deal of shame. This is a little bit of a trivia thing, but do you know that the, the word, the root word for shame and to hide and isolate is the same word, to hide? What does shame make us do? Uh, hide and isolate. It's the same. Those people that invented language were very smart. They understood exactly what it was. It, it's the same word. Just as important by fearlessly and objecting and reviewing past behaviors and why you engage in them, I'll get back to that, you can courageously start to separate yourself from your disease. Sometimes, some of these character defects, if you will, anger, uh, resentments, if you will, isolating, defensiveness, putting up walls, sometimes at one time it made sense. Those character defects made sense. Sometimes we had to have them. I did as a child. I grew up in a very contentious atmosphere, in a very contentious atmosphere. I learned to fight quick. I learned to fight quick. I learned how to be angry, how to be very angry quick. It helped me. I grew up in, a, in an atmosphere, the town I grew up in, a little small textile town, was incredibly competitive. They com competed. There were fights everywhere, bullies everywhere, fights everywhere. That's just the law of the land. That's the jungle I grew up in. And you learn to fight, and, and, and you learn to be angry to help you fight at a very early age. And I did. And I did. And I and anger served me well. I'm not so sure that anger didn't get me my football scholarship because I played pissed off. And I played like a crazy guy. And I wasn't that good, but I played crazy. And uh, that helped me. And everything. But then when you get to be an adult and you got a family and you're out there in the business world and you're trying to, guess what doesn't work anymore? Anger doesn't work anymore. And that was hard for me to understand. And that was hard for me to figure that out. And so I still walk around this hot-headed guy, quick to anger, doing all this stuff. And, and, and to help me get, I'll tell y'all the truth. This is that, this, I, I'm not going to lie to you. I, I, I can't lie to you. I'm not going to. One is I try to work an honest program, and two, you're my brothers and sisters in recovery. I, I ain't gonna do it. Um, I I drank. I, I, I'm not gonna do war stories here, but I I, I drank a lot. I drank a big time drinker. Um, when I quit drinking, I had to work on my anger. My biggest therapy or recovery, if you will, was my anger more than mine. I had more urges to be angry than I had to, to drink. I had to really work on my anger. I had to work tooth and nail on my anger. And one of the things that helped me was understanding why was I such a hothead? Why was I such a time bomb, a walking volcano? Because at one time I needed that. I didn't need that anymore. So there we go. Accept, let it go, let it go, let it go. So, so that's really helped. So, so sometimes we really need to take a good look at why did I do, why did I do those things? It'll help you root up some stuff. And know this if you don't know anything else. You are not your disease. You are not what your disease, your disease. Too often we think we are what we have done. Too often we think we are what has happened to us. 
Those are lies. That's exactly what Adam was talking about right there. We think we are what in the with the, the what we grew up as. Um, there's a concept called basic shame, and basic shame basically works like you think that there's something wrong with you simply because you were bold. Like at birth, there was some kind of permanent birthmark put on you. The family you lived in, the, the father may have been gone, and 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 you, and the family. It, all, you guys know what I'm talking about. Just by just by the way you grew up and who you were, there's something wrong with you. You got to challenge that. You got to challenge that. Um, you can't you can't buy into that. So you separate yourself from your disease by being doing what the next right thing, doing them being that person principle. But but it it is as important as anything you'll get from me in this entire presentation. You are not your disease. Your disease wants you to think you are, but you're not. You're not. And you have to do. And all of your actions separate yourself from your disease. And the tenth step, so you do the tenth step every night. You will start discovering yourself as this man or woman. A, a principal character. All right, so this is a transformation. This is the start of the transformation. This is the start of, the, of basically the fourth step and in, in, in being the, in working into the fifth step. In rebuilding an old farmhouse, you're basically faced with three tasks. You identify what you have, you identify what you don't have, and you identify what has to be removed. And you are an old, metaphorically speaking, you're an old farmhouse and we're going to rebuild you. We're going to build you back up. You got the foundation. What's your foundation? Honesty, acceptance, hope, faith, and trust. You got that. Now we're going to start building that up. Now, in this transformation in the old and into old, the new things have to be considered, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Are you going to condemn this old farmhouse? Of course not. You're simply getting the facts, creating a blueprint, a vision, and starting the work. Now, listen to me. Listen to me. How many of you, in the sound of my voice, while you are here and why you have been here, have you ever really sat down and said to yourself, what do I want to look like a year from now? How do I want to feel a year from now? In terms of character, who do I want to be a year from now? In other words, have you really created a vision of who you want to be as a man or a woman? I'm not talking about career. I'm talking about as you, as an individual. Have you ever really done that? Well, I say if you haven't, start tonight. Because how in the world are you going to know if you're getting closer to who you want to be, if you haven't put that vision in your head, who you want to be, what it's going to look like when you get there? Your vision is your goal as a man or a woman. Have you done that? If you haven't, you start tonight. And when you create that vision of yourself and you start throwing those words in there, well, in my vision of myself, I want courage. I want integrity. I want honesty. You've got something now to work off of because now you can say, when you're getting there to respond, get ready to respond to any given situation, you can say, you got this vision of yourself. This is how much I want my children to see me. This is how I want to feel. You can say, this thing I'm getting ready to say, this thing I'm getting ready to do. Is that going to move me toward this person I want to be? Or is it going to take me back to toward the person I don't want to be? How are you going to do that if you don't have a vision? Challenge. Challenge. Create a vision. This is how I want to feel. This is how I want to sound. This is how I want to be. This is who I want to be. And then work toward that. Now you got something to work off of. If you, if you haven't created that vision, how are you going to know? You're going to know. All right, courage. And so it is with step four. With honesty and courage, you start the transformation of self from old to new. Think legacy here. From weak to strong, from shame to pride, from despair to hope. Just the facts. Honesty. This thing happened and I did this. I have done bad things, but I'm not a bad person. I have made mistakes, but I'm not one. I will seek to do better and I can do better because now I know this for a solid gold fact. I am not my disease. Now, I've done this with the men. Uh, I'll throw this, some of the men, they, they remember. I'll throw this out toward the lady side. Is there a difference between bravery and courage? Yes. Hush. 
<laughs> Is there a difference between bravery and courage? He says. So. <laughs> I didn't hear the first part about that. That didn't take a lot of courage to say that. All right, for time's sake. The brave people take on the dragon when the dragon shows up. The courageous go out and find their dragons and slay them. So they don't ever show up again. So they don't hurt them and they don't hurt the people they love again. Our program demands courage. Our program demands that you look within yourself, in your journaling, in your individual sessions with your counselors, in your group work, and you say, these are my dragons. I can't have them anymore. I'm going to go out there and find them. Will you help me slay them? Will you listen to my story about them? And the more you do that, the less power they have, the less power they have, the less power they have. So eventually you have slain your dragons. So our program demands courage. Our, our serenity prayer says what? Give me what? The courage to change the things I can. Give me the courage to go out there and find what I need to be, what needs to be found and slay my dragons. There is a huge difference and we're asking you to be courageous. Um, there's a, I like this definition of courage. Courage is not the absence of fear, it's walking through the fear. The story goes that the, that the little boy uh, asked his daddy, he said, Daddy, can you be scared and have courage at the same time? And the father said, Son, how would you have courage if you weren't scared? Courage, fear is a call to be courageous. It's a call to be courageous. Not a call to slink back. It's not a call to be a coward. Fear is a call, is a call to rise, to rise and be more courageous. Uh, in the spirit of the resentments that I talk about, it's one of my favorite quotes in the world. Gandhi says, "Resentment, for, excuse me, forgiveness is for the strong, the weak never even attempted." I've spoken eloquently about resentments, and that's a whole nother lecture. And I'll tell you something else: that's a whole nother lecture. But the number one resolution to your resentments is forgiveness. Forgiveness. Forgiveness is not a gift. Forgiveness is a gift you give yourself. Forgiveness ain't got anything to do about the other person. Forgiveness is a gift you give yourself. Um, and, and that's that again. Just don't walk out of here with the resentment you brought in, please. It is curious that physical courage is everywhere, but moral courage is so rare, and I'm going to talk about that here in a minute. Courage doesn't always jump up and roar. Sometimes it is that quiet voice at night that says, I will try again tomorrow. Doesn't that sound a little bit like that definition of hope we talked about? It's that voice in the middle of the night that says, keep trying, keep trying, keep pushing, keep pushing. And that requires a lot of courage. If I had to, to break down this entire program into two words, if I, if, and I think I can, in two words, this what I would say is the entire 12-step philosophy is moral courage. In other words, do I have the courage to do the right thing? And sometimes that courage might mean I need to go ask somebody to help me do it. Or I might need to go tell somebody I'm getting ready to do the wrong thing and help me pull out of that. That's step two. That's how you use it. You need to keep hope alive. Moral courage. Do I have the courage to do the next right thing? And like I said last night, what's the reward for doing the right thing? Haven't done it. Haven't done it. What does that courage give you? Perseverance. It gives you drive. It gives you hope. It gives you courage. It gives you everything. You never, tenacity. You never give up. You never give up. You never give up. Uh, I don't know in my life, and some of y'all will remember this, and if you don't, I, I'll, I, I need to show it to you on the video, but do you remember the Jim Balvano at the SP? Do you remember that fame that night? A dead man. Some, some of y'all might know who I'm talking about. You may not. He was the coach at NC State, and he was riddled, riddled, eaten alive with cancer. And ESPN was giving him an award on courage, I guess it was. And, it, and um, they literally had – Mike Krzyzewski had to help him up, up on the stage to stand there. And as a matter of fact, he died three months after that. And um, he talked about establishing the Balbano uh, – project for cancer research research which over the years has raised hundreds of millions of dollars and and here's a dead man 
Here's a dead man standing there. And he said, never give up. Never give up. He said, cancer can take my body. It can take my mind. But it can never touch my soul. It can never touch my soul. Man that died three months later. Telling us, never give up, never give up, never give up. There's a lot to be learned for that. I sat in front of that TV set that night, and I cried like a baby. A I, 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 few times in my life have I ever been so inspired by somebody. Okay. All right. Step five. Moving right along here. I got all kind of notes in step five. So hang with me there for a second. So... <clears throat> A great word, a great word, a word that must be incorporated into your belief system about yourself, a word that must be incorporated into your vision about yourself. Integrity. I'll get to the definition here in a minute. But step five, we're going to tell somebody else about this, all these things we have done. So as we begin to take inventory into in the goal of, am I doing the right thing? Did I go one too many? All right. You know, 22 comes before 23. All right. I didn't tell you all good. I just tell you all work hard. All right. As we begin to take inventory, we begin to suspect how much what? Self-delusion. Self-delusion. We have BSed ourselves. We've, we've lied to ourselves, manipulated ourselves. Has been causing us. We'd have to have outside help if we were surely to know and admit the truth about ourselves. You've got to talk to somebody. Integrity. Now, here's the definition of integrity. A firm adherence to a moral code. A firm adherence to a moral code. A man or woman of true integrity cannot be blasted off of their moral code. You can't make that person do the wrong thing. You can't make that person tell a lie. You can't do it. They hold on to that. That's a person of integrity. If anybody tells you that I know who I am, and if they know what they're talking about, what they're telling you that they know that no matter what happens around them, they know exactly how they're going to respond. And that response is going to be based on a moral code. A belief system made up the principles that what, when used, honor the person using them. That's why you got to have a vision. Your vision becomes your belief system. This is who I am, honest, integrity. Moral, morally driven. I'm not going to be anybody else. That's my vision of myself. That's why it's so important. Why is integrity so important in the fifth step? You better be truthful about what you've written down and what you said, and you better be truthful about who you're, going, who you're talking to, or you, or you blew the whole thing. The whole thing. You may think you, you may, you, you, you may think you manipulated the program. Subconsciously, you know you did. And there goes your self-esteem. There goes that tape. So integrity is huge in this step. You can't BS the system. Our responses weakened us because they were not based on any values. There's that silent killer thing. And our, and, and they, they are our, our standards of morals. Lack of moral courage is the disease. Guys, our, let me just break down real simple. Our disease thrives off our weaknesses. Our disease feast off our weaknesses. Our disease explodes off of our weaknesses. We feed it over and over again. You know how you starve it to death? Starve it to death with your strengths. Starve it to death with your strengths. How are you going to know what your strengths are? You're going to summon them. You're going to ask yourself, what's the best I have? What's the best I have? You're going to challenge yourself to be that kind of person. You starve it with your strengths. The goal of recovery is to reintroduce us to standards and codes that follow that when fo to follow that strengthen us and make us people of strong principal character. The peach, I've been over this, the peach trees will tell you bad fruits, bad roots. Are the fruits of your life disease and infected somehow? Is most everything you're producing bad fruits? Probably so. I don't think you got here because you're on a winning streak. So you need to spend as much time as you can here in your group and individual sessions, in your journaling, in your evening meditation and prayer. What is it that drives me to do such crazy stuff? What's wrong with the roots of my tree? What are the barriers to my, to my true best self? Why, what are my character defects that I need to root out? Why are they there? That's simple surgery. Matter of fact, when Bill Wilson, the Oxford group, they called it soul surgery. Bill Wilson stole all this, by the way, from, from the Oxford group. They called it soul surgery. You just root that, you just cut that stuff out. Just cut it out. And then you get the, the St. Augustine had a beautiful quote the more trash I remove, the more room for the treasure. 
The more trash I take out, the more room for the treasure I can put in. So, what is the 85% of that iceberg we looked at yesterday? And so you find it out. This is where you get that in the fourth and fifth step. What baggage do I need to go? You rid yourself of anything that does not help you, anything that does not honor you, anything that does not help you, anything that does not grow you, anything that does not heal you, anything that does not elevate you, dump it. Get rid of it. You can do that. Is it going to come back? Hell yeah. What do you do? You dump it again. One day it's going to get tired and it's going to quit coming back. And it's not going to have room to come back because one day you have filled that void with principles. Here's a riddle. Hate knocked on the door. Love answered the door. Nobody was there. Don't tell me what I just said. I know what I just said. What did I just say? Hate knocked on the door, love answered the door, nobody was there. Hate and love can't live in the same house. You answer love, hate with love, hate's got to go. Hate's got to bounce. Why don't we try that instead of answering hate with more hate? You say to yourself, well, Warner, maybe I don't want to love that person. Maybe this person that I have this resentment again, okay, I got that forgiveness thing, but you're asking me to love them. I said, no, 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 I'm not. I'm asking you to love yourself enough that you'll fight it, that you'll fight the hate that's in you. Hate and love can't live in the same place. Answer hate with love, love's got to go. I, um, I had the honor of meeting an Episcopal priest down in Birmingham, Alabama. My, my sister introduced me to him, and a uh, fascinating gentleman. Fascinating gentleman. And that night in his sermon, he said something that I wrote down and never forgotten. He said that love is the only force that can defeat evil without becoming evil itself. Love is the only force that can defeat evil without becoming evil itself. In other words, if you're going to take on evil, and there's evil in us, we've got, we've, we've had some evil evil put in there, some wrong put in there. If you're going to take that on, there's only two ways you can do it. You can become as evil as it is, or you can love yourself enough to fight it and take it out with love. That's your call. I'll give it to you. You can do what you want to with it. I can't think of but two reasons. I can't think of but two reasons why anybody would hold on to that stuff. One is they're just not ready. You're not ready for sobriety. You're not ready for freedom. You're not ready for that. You, you just still want to be out there. Fine. If that's who you are, where you are, I, I hope the best for you. And I'm, don't ask me to judge or condemn you. If that's where you are, I hope one day things get different. The other reason is you're using it as an excuse to drink or drug. You're using it as that ace in the hole. That there was one of my patients said one time, he always kept that door cracked just enough to where if he had to, he could walk back in it and do some drinking again. Honesty won't let you do that. If you are truly committed, you'll shut the door on those things. You will dump those things. Guys, do you hear what I'm telling you? This is a life-changing exercise. This is not just some thing you go through and, and, and you become, I don't know, this isn't a rich, get rich scheme or something like that. This is a program designed to change you from where you are to who you want to be, who you have the right to be. Don't half-ass this thing. Embrace it. Embrace it. Do it thoroughly. The word thoroughly, I looked it up one time. The word thoroughly is used in the big book something like 98 times. Thoroughly, thoroughly, thoroughly. If we are painstaking about this stuff, if you're not interested in changing the direction of your life, and I don't know why you wouldn't be, then, then, then slough this thing off. But if you want to be that person, if you want to find out who you are, if you're interested in being the man or woman you have a right to be, please don't tell me there's anybody out there that hasn't seen the Shawshank Redemption. That damn movie's on some TV channel every night somewhere. <laughs> If you ain't seen the Shawshank Redemption, I, I, I hope you have a lot of room in that cave you live in. <laughs> Let's go over the Shawshank Redemption, shall we? You got a guy who thinks he's guilty. 
You got a guy who thinks he's perpetrated a heinous crime. He's killed his wife and her boyfriend. So he goes to jail for life. I guess two lives sentences. He goes to jail. He thinks he's guilty. All right. Somewhere along the line, that this guy comes in from another prison and says, oh, by the way, he's innocent. He didn't really do that. This other dude in this other prison did that. He's an innocent man. So point one, how many of us, and I'm not, don't raise your hand, I'm not looking for that. How many of us are living in a prison we don't deserve to live in? That was your question, by the way. You're in a prison you don't deserve to live in. All right. Well, hell, I'm getting out. I don't know about y'all, but I'm getting out of that place. So do we remember how he got out? How did he get out of the jail cell? Yeah. Our little yeah. rock, yeah. Right? Yeah. And, he, and he cut through the wall. And remember, it took him so long, all the different posters there. He started out with and everything, all that. everything. That's how he got out of the cell. How did he get out of the prison? He cracked the hole in the sewage. Now, let's look at the sewage pipe, because this is an important part of the story. What was in that sewage pipe? Every despicable, unspeakable, gross thing that a human being can put in a sewer pipe, and a hell of a lot of it. How long was that sewer pipe? 500 yards. That's five football fields. What did he do? He crawled in absolute, the most disgusting, disgraceful human filth that you could think of. And for 500 yards, he crawled through that. And do you remember that beautiful scene at the end of it? He breaks out in this beautiful stream and it's raining and he stands there. Not only is he clean, he's free. That's what this man did to gain the freedom that he deserves. My question to you, my challenge to you, how many of you are willing to crawl through that pipe to get to your personal freedom? How many of you are going to have to address shit you don't want to address? How many of you are swear, courageous enough to feel the way you don't want to feel? How many of you are courageous enough to say out loud in a group of other people, here's what I've done, here's what's happened to me, this is how it shaped me, I don't want that anymore, I want to be better. How many of you are willing to do that? Well, if you're going to get free, and that's what recovery is, freedom, you need to crawl through that pipe. Thomas Jefferson said it very clearly, freedom is never free. It's always a price. And let me tell you something. As someone who crawled through that pipe, <laughs> it sucks while you're in there. But let me tell you something. That's a sweet place when you come out. That is a sweet place when you come out. And you ain't never, ever, ever again got to get in that pipe again. That was a challenge, by the way. All right, step five promises. We can look the world in the eye. Let me tell you, this is me. So the men that have been working with me, ladies, y'all don't know me so well, but, or maybe you do by now. Uh, the men that have been working with me know that I'm old school. I am old school and I want to be old school. I'm glad to be old school. Uh, I hadn't bought a new CD or anything, I don't suppose, in 20 years. I don't think they know your CD. Or whatever. <laughs> See, I tell you, I ain't never bought one. I, I mean, I listen to old stuff. I listen to beach music and, and um, uh, uh, Motown and all. I love Stevie Wonder and the Four Tops. And the ten, if, if, if any y'all ever seen Stevie Wonder's wife? He had neither. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> that was bad. <laughs> all right, I listen to that stuff. Let me tell you how old school I am, and I love that music. I I got it out of my car right now. I, I I do. I grew up on it, and I love it, and I can't get enough of it. I think I think it's best music whatever it was. Anyway. Um, this, this is how school school I am. I had an older brother and my daddy, one time when I was a kid, I mean, I probably was eight or nine years old, took my brother and I in his bedroom and we practiced shaking people's hands. My father taught me how to shake another man's hand. Now, my father was six foot five, weighed almost 300 pounds. His name was John, so whatever I call him, Big John, and everything like that. And when I stuck my little hand in my father's hand, it was like putting your hand in a catcher's bed. I mean, he just swallowed my hand. But I learned how to squeeze firmly and look that man, and I had to look up like this. Yes, sir, no, sir, I introduced myself and everything. We practiced that. 
We practice it. I'm not making that stuff up. We can, what are the promises? We can look the world in the eye. To my horror, to my shame, I realized there at the end of my drinking career, at a function one night that I went to, people invited, like, God knows why they invited me there, knowing what I'd probably pull off, but I was there. And I was being introduced constantly to other people, and I found out I could not look them in the eye. I looked down every time. I didn't know that. I didn't know that that's what I had become. That's how far down I went. And it hit me. It hit me. And I, I wanted to die. I wanted to die. You want, is it any wonder that one of my personal recovery goals was that never again, ever in any situation, would I ever never not look somebody in the eye again? That's me. That's where I come from. That's what I believe. But you can look. You can walk in any room, anywhere, with any group of people, from any position, any place, any time, and you can stand shoulder to shoulder with those men and women, and you look every damn one of them in the eye. Demand that they look you in the eye. That's what you become. We find more times of inner peace and ease. Increase confidence, higher self-esteem. With that comes pride, less need for conflict. Our disease thrives off drama, thrives off stress, chaos. We don't want that anymore. You know, dude, I walk away from that stuff. I heard a woman say one time at an AA meeting, I, I, I just, I love the way she said it, and I've used it in so much of my life. The conviction and the resolution in that woman's voice. She said she looked us all well, well, looked us all in the eye, and she said, "I will walk away without hesitation from anything that tries to rob me of my inner peace." So what a stance! What a place to be! I will walk away without hesitation from anything that tries to rob me of my inner peace. That woman, she fought hard to be where she is. She ain't about to give it away to some idiot. Tendency to show more understanding. Instead of judgment, which is resentments, now we start to understand. Tendency to show new and improved you. You're glad to who you are. More instances of spontaneous laughter, joy, and happiness. I'll tell you a secret. You know why I tell these stupid little jokes, don't you? Because it might be the only time all day any of you laugh. This method to my madness. You'd think that there would be a joke that you laugh at. <laughs> we feel more comfortable using higher powers, asking for help. We start to realize the spiritual experience. What's the spiritual experience? Thank you. Change of character. Mention in step 12. All right, wrapping up. Uh, two quick stories and then we're out of here. And again, thank y'all so much for your respect and your patience and all this. I, I can't imagine having to listen to me for six damn hours. We ain't got nothing else to do, so we might as well. All right. I did one four step. I know some people to do a four step every year. I did one four step. There ain't gonna be enough of them. I ain't doing it again. But I did one four step, but I did two fifth steps. Let me tell you, let me share about my two fifth steps. And I'm gonna tell you why I did. I'm, there's a reason why I'm telling you this story. The first fifth step was obviously with my sponsor. We uh, we were down in South Florida, and every Sunday we went to this sunrise meeting on the beach, and it was real cool. Uh, but there'd be anywhere from 25 to 30 people there every Sunday morning standing there on the beach. And when the sun came up, we sat out and we had we had our we started our meeting. Uh, we all parked in the Holiday Inn parking lot, and we walked by the pool. Signs everywhere: don't take furniture down to the beach. We took all the furniture down to the beach, and and we sat there. Them and everything, and my sponsor and I had agreed that after that meeting, he and I would stay on the beach uh, in the in the beautiful, beautiful, dri golden dripping South Florida morning. We we pulled the chairs close to the shore. The the water was kind of just lapping at our feet and everything. It was, I mean, it was right out of Hollywood. And we sat there, and I was nervous as I could be. And I started, and I I looked at my and, and I'm I'm 40, I'm in my forties. I'm over forty years old. And uh, I felt like a five-year-old little boy who couldn't find his mom. I had my lip tremble. Tears came to my eyes. And I talked about this. And I spilled my guts. And I told stuff. I told stuff that day that that, that, that is the only human being that's ever heard that story. And will be the only human being, by the way, that'll hear that stuff. I'm not sharing any of that with anybody else. And I talked and I talked. And when it was over with, I felt like the lowest worm on earth. How could anybody... Have, have, have done some of the crap I had done. 
had reduced myself like I had reduced myself. And I did. I, I, I wanted to just go somewhere and cry. And I looked at him, and my sponsor looked at me, and he said, are you through? And I'm sure I sounded like a five-year-old little kid, my trembling lip. And I looked at him, and I said, yes, sir, I'm through. And he tapped me on the knee. He said, I love you. Let's go eat breakfast. What a gift. What a gift. What a gift that man gave me. It was over. It was over. It was over, guys. That shit was gone. It did, it's, I know how I sound, and I don't want to sound like I'm on the Oprah show or something like that. If you do this stuff right, it will change you. I had the most immediate sensation of just relief. Just relief. It was over. I didn't have to do, I, I didn't ever have to be that person again. So it was amazing. It was amazing. Again, it was an incredible gift that somebody gave me. Um, I mentioned before that um, in, in the house I lived in, it was it was very contentious. It really was. Now I'm gonna tell you something. I hope my mom and I always feel bad about this because I know my mom and daddy listen to me. But um, I had great I had great mom and daddy, great people, great human beings. My father was a was a World War II hero. I've got the, the medals in a, in a suitcase at my house. He was a strong businessman. He helped a lot of people. Uh, my mother uh, was huge with the Salvation Army in our little hometown. She made me and my brothers and sisters. We literally had to get in the car and go knock door to door. And, and collect dimes for the March of Dimes. That's the kind of people, my mother bought, she, she knew, she had a list about this long of, of people who couldn't afford turkeys for Thanksgiving. And she would ride to Charlotte, North Carolina, and cause we couldn't get them in my little hometown, and buy a car full of turkeys and take them back and distribute them. Uh, that's, she did that. That's just the kind of woman she was. But you know what, from time to time, my mom and daddy just weren't very good parents. They just weren't very good parents. They weren't what we wanted, or certainly what I wanted, and so, so there was some there was some prices to pay for all of that, and there was a lot of resentment, a lot of anger, and all that and everything. So so I just leave it at that because it's not my time to tell my, my story. But here's what I did. Let me tell you what I did, and 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 also there was another thing, and I, I really need to abbreviate this. Just quite simply, I found out later in life that some of the things that I had been told about some of my ancestors, if you will, who were not that far away, the kind of median ancestors, was not true. It was simply a lie. It was a made up lie. They were covering for them. Actually, what I found out was that some, some people that, that I thought were heroes were, were far from it, far from it. So I found out I'd been lied to. The whole system had lied to me. And I got hot. I got very hot, I got very disgusted, and I turned my back on the entire friggin' crowd, and I walked away. It's just that damn simple. I didn't want anything to do with that crowd. Brothers and sisters, mom and daddy, that's not going to screw them. All right, that was me, that's how I handled it. All right, I couldn't live like that. You can't live like that. You can't live like that. That's family, man. You can't do family. So here's what I did. I was living down in South Florida, and I had some time off. It was in between. Actually, it was in between jobs. And um, I said, I got a. a I talked. I talked to my sponsor about this. I had a long talk with my sponsor. My mom and daddy are buried, are buried in Anderson, South Carolina. Some of these other people I'm talking about are buried are buried in Charlotte, North Carolina. So here's what I did. I got in the car and I drove to Charlotte, North Carolina, almost nonstop from South Florida. And I went to that cemetery and I walked up to those people and I looked at them and I basically said this, I'm sorry. I am sorry. I judged you harshly. I wanted a lot from you. Uh, you weren't what I expected, but I know for a fact I damn sure wasn't what you expected. And, and, and here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask you to forgive me. I'm going to forgive you. And it's over. And we're going to love each other for eternity but I'm asking for your forgiveness and I am forgiving you. And I turned around and got in the car and I drove to Anderson, South Carolina and I drove to that cemetery and I stood in front of my mom and daddy and I said the same thing. Here's the deal. I was very disappointed in you for a lot of times, but I don't remember winning any awards for being the son of the year. And so I'm sure, and I'm sure there were times I scared the holy hell out of my mom and daddy and I, and I know there were. And I know times I disappointed them greatly and here I am trying to judge them for what they, they weren't. And, and, and I'd done what I did to them. So I said, here's the deal. I'm going to forgive you, and I'm going to ask you to forgive me. 
and I did. And again, again, when I got in my car, the incredible sense of relief, it was over. I didn't have to carry that stuff anymore. It was gone, and I didn't want to carry that stuff anymore. Why would I carry that pain? Why would I carry that hate? Why would I carry that disappointment? So here's what I'm telling you. Here's why I'm trying to tell you. And as our friend Chris here said it so eloquently, guys, do not have asked this thing. You have no idea what's coming your way if you do it right. You have no idea the relief and the freedom, the freedom from your own personal bondage, the relief you can feel, the growth you can feel, the healing you can feel. You got no idea, but I, but but you will if you do it. But you will if you do it. That's part of the promises. Don't believe me. Read your promises. And if you don't believe the promise of me, if you ever get a chance to go to another AA or NA meeting, ask some of the people there. And they'll tell you the same thing. And that's why I told you the stories about my two fist steps. I want you to have that relief. I want you to have that freedom. I want you to rise. Crawling sucks. We got wings, guys. We got wings. We're eagles. Fly. Fly. No more crawling. No more. You fly. You fly with your head held high. And you fly proud. And you fly, fly tall. And you fly proud. And that's how this stuff works. I wouldn't lie to you. Any questions? What do you do in terms of forgiveness if you're not walking around angry and you don't even hate the person, but they've done something that's unforgivable? Well, nothing's unforgivable. Well, first of all, nothing's unforgivable. That's, I, I don't understand. If you don't hate the person, but you still resent them, how, I don't know how you do that. I don't hate, but I hate what they did. Okay. Okay, then, then, then you got permission to do that. But, but again, I wouldn't use that word hate. I'd be just, I, because hate's poison, ma'am. I, so I don't know you. Okay, don't need to do it. It hates poison. Don't put that word in your, don't put it in yourself. It's okay to be disappointed, but you rise above that disappointment. See, forgiveness is never about forgetting. You know, they say forgive and forget. That's stupid. That ain't never going to happen. But what you're forgetting, you're, what you're losing, you're not losing the memory, you're losing the memory of the pain. And that's what you're trying to get rid of. That stuff will stick forever. You, a battered wife is going to forget that somewhere, somehow? It's impossible. But what you're forgetting, what you're trying to do, see, this is a gift you give yourself. You rise above. You're bigger than what happened to you. <clears throat> There's a quote that says, you know you're truly forgiven when that person, place, thing walks freely through your mind. So that's what you work on. No, we don't ever have to like those kind of abuses or those kind of disappointments. But what you do is you get bigger than them. Now, you know you're, you and I are opening the door to about 200 hours of therapy. <laughs> and so my words of wisdom, I don't expect you to go flying out the door a changed person, but I'd ask you to think about it. You don't, don't, yes, it, that, it says a lot about you that you don't hate that person, but of course we don't hate, we don't like what happened. But you rise above what happened. You're bigger than what happened. It's behind you. It doesn't shape you anymore. You're bigger than it. And that's tough. That's a mountain, but it's climbable. It's very climbable. Millions and millions and millions of climb, and you can do it. Very good question. Thank you. Did you get an answer? Okay. Any other questions? All right. Any comments? Men's primary has a coin out service right after this. Okay. Make sure that you put the chairs back up when, when you do that. Any observations? Any suggestions? Once again, thank y'all for your patience. We'll wrap it up tomorrow. And um, I, I just appreciate the respect that y'all given me in the process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.